Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of the RGM Podcast. We're here in another week. We've got another band on his hands. And today, ladies and gentlemen, we're joined by Nick and soon... Uh, sorry, we're joined by Johnny now and soon to be Nick. He's going to be joining us in a few minutes. From the horn. Hey, up, mate. How are you doing? You all right? Yeah, good. Thanks, Scott. Where are you um, calling from today? I'm in Manchester today. Um, and I live in sunny Manchester, so that's where I'm based. And my first question to you all is, uh, you know, where where are you? Where where do you find yourself today? Yeah, so I'm actually near where Nick grew up, which is St John's Wood, and I'm in, oh. uh, which is sort of north central London, and I'm uh, oh. at Rack Studios, um, recording for a different project. But um, we did we did make some music with the horn last year. Uh, sorry, actually no, this year. Uh, at the studio so it's really nice to i'm just in one of the engineers uh kind of overnight bedrooms where they oh, sometimes no. if you have a late late night session you, you stay over oh, um no. so yeah i'm in st john's wood near macca near paul mccartney's sort of gaff yeah well i, I can That's remember getting nice. a tube to st john's Wood just to have a nosy and have a look at abbey road studios how, how far away yeah. how far is away to the, the to the to the crossing oh yeah like five minutes away Oh right, really? okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, well that's exciting having someone actually in Rack Studios. That's nice. It's just, it's one of those legendary places that you just you hear about, don't you? It's nice to speak to someone who's actually in it. That's a nice change. Uh well, I, it's it's my pleasure to be able to do this. My session starts at eleven. Yeah, so sure. per- perfect. So thank you so much for having me on so early in the morning. I actually left the missus in bed in Hackney. Uh, <laughs> right. She normally would be up earlier than me. Yeah. But I got up early sort of just make sure that I made the interview on time and made the yeah. uh, recording session on time. Well, I know um, it must be an unearthly time for a musician. You know, if uh, anybody listening to this or watching it, it's 10 o'clock in the morning, for God's sake. So, yeah, I know musicians don't like too early, do you? You know. No, exactly. My face doesn't look how it's supposed to in the morning. I, 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 I always think, like, um, you know, there's some people who I walk past on the, on the yeah. streets of London and some of them just look like they've, They've been awake for hours and they look radiant and gorgeous. And I just look like I've been, yeah, thrown out of the back of a bus. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. So let, let's get to know you guys a bit. So you've just come off a big, massive tour with Scouting for Girls. You've had your debut album. All these exciting things have been happening recently. Well, let, before we get on to that side of things, let's rewind a little bit. So talk me through, um, where did your life as a creative start, Johnny? We'll start with you first. Goodness me. Um, what a generous question. How long have you got? No, I'll try and keep it concise. Uh, I started off as acting. There was a, there's a theatre in, in Cornwall. There's this amazing woman who's unfortunately no longer alive anymore, but she's called Rowena Cade. And she um, she had a cliff uh, uh, that she owned in, in, uh, in, in Cornwall. Mm. And with her gardener, she took a load of dynamite and blew up uh, the cliff near Penzance you might have been down there mm-hmm. and she she loved uh so she loved theater so much that she made an amphitheater out of the cliff mm-hmm. and most people in Cornwall they just go fishing or you know if they've got land yeah. but she was like I'm going to build a theater and put on <laughs> some Shakespeare um so yeah so I was very lucky that my my family it was a bit of a traveling circus my family were were in the theater at the time and they were teaching they were English te- my parents were both English teachers and they both um, loved theatre so they put and so like while everyone was kind of hating uh hating Shakespeare in uh, in English class mm. I was ins- insufferably a know at all but basically I then kind of grew up and realized I kind of loved David Bowie and Bob Dylan and I right. kind of changed my career path after about I mean, when I was 22 23 I was still acting yeah. And I, I got to drama school and blah, 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 and had failures and successes and all kinds of things. And then, yeah, I just uh, decided to become a musician when I was about 20. I broke my leg on a motorbike in uh. near Thailand, in Laos, and was in hospital for a long time because I couldn't walk for a while. And it was terrible. But just, I... Were you, just, were you just being a daffle lad out there then? I mean, absolute, uh, yeah, C, triple asterisk out there and yeah it was just a daft lad is, is a, a lovely way much nicer way of putting it but yeah the um uh, yeah it's it's i just i had an mp3 player and i was just like oh, music's pretty cool and i listened to 
Station to Station by David Bowie. And I listened to it in particular Golden Years. I remember thinking, that's the coolest thing I've ever heard. Um, like, just when he starts going like, wap, wap, wap. And I was like, oh, you can do that. You can go into a studio and make weird noises into a microphone and then people will come and watch. <laughs> and I think that it's also, my brother is an amazing musician as well. He inspired me a lot. And I think there have been various people along the way who have shown me, you know, how you can really connect with people just by being in a park with an acoustic guitar, being a bit of a layabout, being getting yeah. stoned with someone until the early hours of the morning and writing songs. Mm. Um, and that really <laughs> appealed to me, that lifestyle. <laughs> and now it's a now it's a bit more professional than that. But um, it, it's it, there are times when it feels like reverting back to that lifestyle yeah. is is there's a sort of soul feeling, you know, there's a sort of feeling where I feel comfortable like that with a very shitty, excuse my French, with a very rough uh, looking guitar in my hand. Mm. And I think like like a like a Spanish guitar, you know, just with nylon strings and just just kind of trying to figure out something on that and sitting around and, and I think that's um that's sort of where my soul belongs, I think. As as well as like various various kind of pubs in Soho. I think that's also where my soul belongs. But yeah, it's like I think I think um I think that my family have offered like my you know my mum was like don't you know you do whatever you want my dad was like you should carry on acting so there's always been a bit of a divide in myself mm. about whether I should act or sing well, but be- yeah that's sorry that's a really long answer to no no, no no just going back to you you know you said while you were an actor you had uh, plenty of successes and failures talk us through those successes and failures oh goodness me <laughs> um these yeah so. Well, as I was 13, I, I auditioned for Harry Potter and I got very close. I got very close to being the part of Harry Potter. I was actually in the news oh. about it this, this year, which is oh, weird. Okay. Um, I, I got very close. And so that was upsetting. But then I thought, you know, I'd be worth a lot of money and I, I might not, you know, I don't know. Is Danny, I hope Daniel Radcliffe is happy. He might, he might be. Uh, he may, may still be happy. I don't know. But he grew up on, on a film set. So I don't know how that feels. So for a while, I was a little bit bitter as a teenager that I didn't get that part. Mm. But uh, hey, no. But uh, yeah. I think like with yeah, and then later on, I got an agent when I was nineteen. Yeah, and just didn't make the most of that, and didn't make the most of that. Met some amazing friends in university, but I didn't make the most of uh, of of what I'd ha- of what I'd got. Mm. And then by the time I reached twenty three, twenty four, as I said, I kind of felt like I'd kind of failed as an actor and uh, discovered mm. David Bowie. So that, that I think my music career kind of coincided with being like, uh, you know, maybe the acting's fizzling out a little bit. But then the success is I went, I went to Austria once and did a, a film. My 23rd birthday, I was riding a horse through the snow and holding a sword. So that felt like a success. Uh, nice. So yeah, <laughs> actually, I, I remember I was contracted. Uh, so I think I, I think my my contract was like twenty thousand euros or something, yeah. and I didn't. None of us in the whole project was a flop, and we didn't get paid. But uh, I had the best time, <laughs> so it was still kind of a success in my head because I I was just like riding a horse. So yeah, I think that I I retrospectively like okay, that's a, I chalked that up as a success. And not as a, and not as a failure. Although financially, it was definitely a failure. <laughs> yeah, no. But, well, it, you know, yeah. well, so, you, so you pick one of the hardest industries in the world, and then yeah, it to trying to make a career in, in the other hardest career in the world. Then, <laughs> the yes, music. I mean, and well, to segue to segue into our, our latest guest, who looks very nice this morning, um, I I think that. Uh, you know, Nick is someone, and I've said this before in previous instances, yeah. Nick is someone who he could have, you know, gone and bought another car or something, but he's decided to invest into, you know, into the music industry. And I'm really grateful mm. for that. He's he's really um, an incredibly wonderful guy and just able to um, write songs on a dime. You know, he can write songs just out of nowhere. Mm. And I think, oh yeah, I'm very glad that I met Nick because he's been a big part of my journey in the last three years. Hmm. So I'll hand you over to Nick. Yeah, so Nick joins us now. Uh, Nick, would you mind just putting your camera to the side for me, please, pal? Voice. Yeah, let me try that. Thanks. Okay, mate. Thank you. 
Right. So we, we, we've just been having a right good chat with Johnny about how it all began and started and that kind of stuff. So he, he, he's in Rack Studios. What impressive building are you in, mate? I'm in my apartment, which is not too far from Rack Studios. Wow. We're, I'm, in, I'm in Marble Arch in an apartment in oh. my home. Really? Yeah, but he does. But he is. It is impressive because who's your neighbour, Nick? So my next door neighbour is Madonna, actually. Oh, OK. Is she in? Um, uh, I think she is actually, yeah. Because of course. She's, oh, okay. she's, she, she's doing shows at the O2. So, oh, uh, okay. Is she joining us in a bit then? Is she uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go and get her. <laughs> Fair enough. Oh, brilliant. That's impressive. So, uh, so how was life in London then? How, you know, uh, in the biggest city in the world, in the best, most cultural city in the world, how, what's life in London as a, as a jobbing musician at the minute? How, how, how have you seen uh, the industry develop uh, down south, as they say? Well, me personally, I, I think uh, you know London is is just teeming with stuff to do. So the problem is, what do you not do? You know, it's, it's every, every single day, every night, it's, it's some, there's so many things on. You mm. know, uh, it's in, it's just incredible. I mean, I, I've always thought of London as really as being a country more than a, a city because you know it's, it's just such a melting pot. And you know, but actually, where I live is. You know, it is so multicultural. It literally is insane, but, you know, in a really good way. So um, music, I mean, the thing about music in London is in some ways it's actually changed quite a lot since I was younger, because I used to be in a band in the 80s. Yeah. And in those days, you had so many incredible legendary music places, um, one of which, well, my favourite place that I ever played was the Marquee. Um, which was in Wardle Street in Soho. And there's sort of nothing like that really anymore on the West End, is there, Johnny? So it's changed. Nice. You know, funny enough, actually, a few days ago, um, we did a, an amazing uh, thing that is almost ridiculous, uh, but we actually did it. So it's now memory. And when we were talking about it, you know, there was a, a lot of the guys in the band and the, and, and the people working with us said, oh, it's just too much hassle. Um, but when anyway, we did it, which is we did two gigs in one night, mm. um, uh, we we were lucky enough to get the opportunity f to support um, Star Sailor mm. um, at the at the Electric Ballroom, which um, mm. is such a legendary place, and where I saw the Clash play, um, which is something to say. Um, uh, and then after we did that, I did a little small acoustic set, and Johnny was brilliant, if I can say. Uh, and then we all walked with our with our few instruments, um, a five minute walk down to the Roundhouse, which is literally a mm. five minute walk, walk away. Another legendary, incredible venue where we were lucky enough to support Scouting for Girls, and it was absolutely full when we came on. So you know, between two to three thousand people. So it was a incredible night. So you know that, uh, the, and then after that, we 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 went to Coco. I don't know if you know Coco, which is yeah. a fantastic, fantastic venue to have to celebrate, have something to eat and drink, and you know. So that was really cool. That's a re that was a really cool rock we, and roll night. You mentioned Star Sailor there. We, we we've had James on the podcast before. Have you ever met anybody as relaxed and chilled out as that guy before? He he, he was kind of he was upright, but he could have just been laid down and just chilled. He was just so relaxed, such a nice, calming vibe about that guy. Yeah, it's Lovely. it's so yeah. nice to meet him when we were we met him last year didn't we nick yeah and he was like he he was very shy with us in the dressing room mm. and and then i remember i think i popped into the dressing room in in um i think it was like nottingham or somewhere and he and he just went oh do you want a beer mm. <laughs> and just like gave, gave us like a whole load of beers left over that they they weren't drinking and then i remember when me and nick and danny watched him play I think we because we played we supported them at the O2 Ritz mm. near where you are potentially um yeah, and and that was made that was one of my favorite venues ever I'm, and go that, I'm uh, going there tonight to watch the wonder stuff oh <laughs> uh, the wonder stuff nice oh how, you'll have a, you'll have a <laughs> great time favorite band yeah I love them it, uh, it, it, I don't know if you've noticed but the floor is springy yes oh yeah the O2, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Sure, it might be something you picked up as, as someone <laughs> who go, goes to gigs in Manchester. But yeah, um, James. I, then I remember that me and Nick and Danny were kind of struck by how kind of immediately loud his voice is at the microphone. Like he's yeah. got an incredible projection ability. Mm. 
So it, it sort of goes completely at odds with yeah, him yeah. as a person and hang, yeah. hanging out with him. It's yeah. such, a, such a switch. Um, I found that interesting. That he, you know, the sort of contrast of him in conversation and then him on stage. He's a real sort of like, what's the right word? It, it's like but just the, the ability to project his voice so sort of immediately and loudly. Um, it's very, it's, it's quite quite a technique. It, it, yeah. it is such just an amazing, unique thing that comes out of his mouth, isn't it? <laughs> for, for such a gentle, quiet, chilled out guy. It's, uh, it's amazing how talent can just find one part of your body and just make a difference to your life. <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's, a, that's a very... I think it's from Manchester, isn't it? Uh, I can't remember exactly. Uh, no, mm. I'm, not, I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure. Well, a fun fact while yeah. we're on that topic, sorry, before you yeah. and Nick talk more, I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, what's interesting is that um, thanks very much to Nick, I managed uh, to meet a guy called Danton Supple who produced and, and Nick. Mm. Nick and and the label managed to organise this producer, this wonderful producer who produced the horns music. Mm. And he's actually about four meters away from me <laughs> now, working working on something else. I'm just doing some guest singing for another project, which isn't it, it's it's fun, but it's not quite the horn. Um, yeah. But Danton produced "Silence Is Easy" by Star Sailor. Oh, nice! So there yeah. you go. There's the link. Oh, nice one, nice one. Well, uh, just on uh, yourself there a little bit, Nick. What what was this previous band that you mentioned earlier? Then, yeah, so it was early eighties. Uh, yeah, um, we were called Friends of Gavin. Oh. Um, we do have something out on Spotify, but we didn't put anything out in the, at oh. the time. We were too crazy. Um, <laughs> okay. I mean, literally, literally, that is you know a bad, not a great story actually in a, in a way because we put a lot, <laughs> we put a lot into it, and and uh, sadly pissed it all away on having fun but at well, least we've got some great some it, great, mem- got some great memories it's a great story <laughs> for a podcast mate give us the gist of it all well i just think we just you know in fact i was listening to johnny's story which was it was nice to hear it from johnny um but in, in a way my, my my story is bizarrely similar in some ways because um uh what changed my life was um buying the album aladdin saying um, when i was when I was very young by David Bowie, funnily enough, and that literally changed everything for me. Um, and then punk came along, and I was a massive Susie and the Banshees fan and The Clash and all the rest of it. And um, so, you know, it, it, the, the whole point of cla- of the of punk was, you know, anyone can do it kind of thing. So we thought, well, we can do it, and so we did. Um, <laughs> we formed a band. We not, n- none of us could play, and then sort of a year later, we all could somehow. Don't know how that happened, but we could, and it just so happened that we could write songs, and and we got a fantastic manager who really believed in us and touting us around to for big label stuff, and got us on all sorts of tours. Um, we were lucky enough to play around two hundred gigs in a few years, so we got you know we got really quite good on the road. Mm. Um, we played a bunch of dates on rem's world tour which was mad um uh, you know we but we, we were just having too much fun um a bit like johnny getting too stoned um <laughs> drinking too much um and we just didn't take it seriously which is a shame you know in hindsight it was stupid but you know when you're that stupid and young and foolish you think that you know the world you know it's never going to end the, the life yeah. and um Anyway, so it, it was it was great and great memories, and we played so many gigs with so many huge bands, Boomtown Rats. Um, there was a very big band at the time called The Alarm. Don't know if you ever heard of The Alarm, but they they were huge at the time, and we did a tour with them, and they absolutely loved us. We loved them, and our singer uh, got married, um, and it all sort of fell apart. So I mm. went out and started a business um, in the marketing world and um, that's been a hell of a ride. And um, yeah, a few years ago, I just wanted to write some songs and didn't certainly didn't intend to create what's been created. That wasn't the idea. Um, I met Danny, who's the guitar player in the horn, who's an amazing guy. And um, he's a, he's an engineer in a, in a studio and a producer and multi, multi talented multi-musician can play just about everything and um as uh, johnny said he used to be in a band with danny so 
that was the link. He introduced me to Johnny and we got on really well. And um, Johnny and I have got some kind of weird thick sense writing style. We, we just sit down and somehow we write songs that, um, you know, obviously I'm biased. I think they're great, but, you know, it's up to other people if they think. But, you know, please listen and tell us what you think. Um, mm. Because our, our album is out with 10 tracks, that are, you know, and uh, we, we're, we're almost close to our millionth stream, which mm. we're very close to, which we're excited about. Mm. So, uh, yeah, so it's, it's, what, it's been that, a hell, that, hell of a ride. What's that, a five of these days, is it? Uh, yeah. Well, he's being facetious. Yeah, he, 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 five, five, five. <laughs> Point point five of a pence, I think. Is, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. What is on on Spotify? If you're lucky, but yeah. So what started as something has turned into something quite exciting, and the Horn is now uh, you know great band, good live band. Um, we put out our album, which we're super proud of, called People Like Us, which you can listen yeah. on all streaming platforms. Um, and you know, next year we've got lots of big plans. We want to maybe play in Europe. That's mm. maybe one of the plans next year. We'll see. Um, just before we yeah, move we... on to the promotion stuff and where we are today, uh, mm. I've just got to ask you. You mentioned REM. I've just got to ask. I can't, I can't let that pass. What was it like being on tour with REM and the lads? With 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 who? With REM. German. Oh, REM. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, did I, I think I just said REM because I'm just used to saying REM. That's the name of the magazine. Oh, it's REM. Sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. Yeah, REM. Yeah, um, next band. That's Carl's <laughs> next band. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the truth is, it was it was fantastic because uh, yeah, we were like rabbits in the headlight, you know, mm. coming on stage in front of twenty thousand people. You know, yeah. um, we, we sort of felt frauds, um, but uh, we enjoyed it, and they were they were really nice. Actually, um, they took themselves very seriously, and we were the opposite. So we thought they were a bit like sort of. Mm. old folk old fogies kind of thing at the time um but you know michael stipe was you know he was nice enough a bit a little bit strange but yeah he was nice enough and um uh peter buck he was the, their guitar player in rem he, he was nice nice guy and they, they, were, they were very they were sweet they were nice they took themselves very seriously we, yeah. we, when we didn't so there was a bit of a clash there in in what way in what way strange may I add? Because so for for me, I, I look for the strange people. I like the strange people in life. I think I, I look yeah. out, I look for those people and try. Well, and... you would have liked. Well, you would have liked him then. <laughs> in, in, in what way though? Like like proper mad strange or just like I don't know. No, just really moody. Oh, um, okay. it didn't seem very happy with anything. Or oh. that's, that that was how it came across to us. We were like so excited, like little puppies, you know. Yeah. Jump, jumping about the place and. Yeah. That was just a very, very moody fellow walking around. Oh, right. <laughs> right, fair enough, fair enough. So, uh, so what did you learn from, like, for you both? And a question for you both, really. What, what did you learn in your previous lives that you brought into the horn and, and learned from and um, uh, achieved by doing, uh, for want of a better phrase? Question. Uh, well, I'll, I'll go first, and I'll over to Johnny. So, I think I've taken everything I've ever learned into this and certainly in the songs and the lyrics and what, what we're trying to say what i'm trying to say uh, is it's a it's a life life a lifetime um it's gone into it and um i think it's made me sort of take the opportunity maybe a little bit more seriously <laughs> than i did last yeah. time okay um and, and i think it's just great to try and work with people who are really super talented and see what happens when that when you sort of put the blend together and um you know that the blend between the, the five of us is remarkable it's it's a really lovely thing and ju just on a marketing thing because you mentioned you started a business in marketing has that has that helped you um uh, in any yeah with the band definitely de definitely um it's because <clears throat> you know it's it's uh, it's helped me make this baseball hat oh there you sure. go there you go um but yeah no, of course it has because um i see it as a you know, as 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 a as a production, mm. right. and and I think I think that's really helped this this time. As, as I said last time, I was too young and too silly. Um, I think I've taken all those skills into into the band, and I think you can see it in the in in the in the product. Um, we we got a new our latest single out. It's called Addicted to Love, and we we did a we did a video in a friend of mine's house, and um, which was really lovely. 
Mm. Um, you can see that on YouTube. So yeah, I'd love your thoughts on that actually, because yeah, um, nice. that's got a lot of, you know, my marketing, you know, experience in in that. And um, it's it's actually Johnny, me, and um, and Danny in that video. The, the other two guys sadly couldn't make it. Uh, uh -huh. One was ill, and um, one was one just couldn't get there, which was a shame. So it's yeah. it's, a, it's an unusual one because it's just got the three of us in it. Oh, nice. Well, uh, but what is because um, marketing is such a big, broad word. What what is marketing to you? I've I've had people in on the podcast before that that's into marketing, and some just simply simplify it as making shit look good. Uh, there's so many different facets to it, and when you, I run a magazine, I speak to marketing companies all the time, and there's there's people that flog you uh, uh, many different things really when it comes to marketing. But what does marketing mean to you as a individual? Well, I, I, I my uh, my sort of marketing space I'm in is mm. is a is a particular niche, so I won't really talk about that. But yeah, okay. Uh, my, my, but my dad was an advertising man, uh, so um, I've sort of brought up. You know, so Johnny was brought up with his dad, who was in the theatre. I, I was brought up with, you know, my dad was a, a, a theatre of his own. You know, yeah. uh, as mm. a marketing guy, as he was an ab, you know, pure advertising guy in the nineteen sixties, and lived that crazy ad, ad man life, which, mm. which you know, I found super exciting as a child. So yeah, he he would always say um, to me that um, about advertising that the hardest thing he said was to get somebody into a habit. And the hardest thing is to get someone out of the habit. That was that was what he always used to say. Oh, so. Yeah. Well, it, it, in a, but I'm just after tips to try and get this podcast out to more people. How do you get, you know, in a in a saturated market, what do you do to stand out in a saturated market? It, it's hard work, isn't it? And Very I've tried hard. different things. I've tried rebranding, you know, uh, re-editing the podcast to try and do it. Like I used to do quite short episodes but now uh, i've tended to do more long form conversations and that kind of stuff because i just find them more interesting and i think people watching them find them more interesting than just uh clickbait stuff that you see online that's out there a lot that just you know is just short to yeah. just getting that click because that's worth something um and any tips on you know uh, being in the industry and you know if there's a band watching this to that's in a similar position than me owning a magazine they're in a band they're in a saturated market how do you stand out these days <laughs> so, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I've got any incredible words of wisdom, but yeah, okay. um, the, but the one thing I always sort of talk about within my business and mm -hmm. anyone that I get a chance to talk to about this is it's a for me it's about two things. It's about the qu quality, obviously, yeah. which you know, so it's the quality of the product and the quality of everything you're doing. But it's also about the quantity, and that often gets really overlooked in all sorts of marketing conversations. Mm -hmm. So um, and that's easy to say, very, very hard to do, the quantity. Um, so obviously I couldn't talk particularly about this, about the, yeah, yeah. About, so about, it, what, about that. But, you know, can, if you're going to... Can some people be doing too much and some people be doing not enough? Is it a fine line with that kind of stuff? We, 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 well, for me, no, it's, it's it's all about the, you know, it's about quantity. So if, if, right. if I could, if you could do like an e-shot to... A thousand people, then it, it, it you need to do it to a hundred thousand. Yeah, right. Oh. And, and you need to think really big with the quantity. I mm. think that's the key, as well as the quality. Obviously, you've got to have both. Yeah. So th these skills, Johnny, must be really good. Um, you know, for the band and uh, what what have you learned in your previous life and brought into the horn then? In my previous life, I was um a wine merchant in the fifteen hundreds, so I've learned nothing. <laughs> okay, that's nice. Good answer. Brilliant. Um, Brilliant. No, uh, I, I, I don't know. I, yeah. I, I think the only thing I can, I love what Nick just said about our fathers being. We should talk about that another time. But our, our dads being in two types of theatre that was really interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, he, I think pertaining to what I said earlier about being very lucky in, in terms of like if if someone weren't to be a performer later on in their life, then being thrown on the stage at a, when I was eight years old, isn't particularly, you know, it might not be useful if I then wanted to become, let's say an accountant. Um, but I do think that experience in the theater has served me fairly well in terms of like, there are lots of sort of theaters in life. And I think I was very, very lucky. I think, I grew up with a lot of people sort of being terrified of public speaking and in a non-braggy way, 
I was just not one of those people because I'd been thrown on a stage when I was eight years old in front of about 700 people every night, every year, mm -hmm. the, until I was 20. And so when we play uh, on my birthday, we were lucky enough with the horn to play. Uh, this was just recently on the 25th of November, we played Birmingham 02. And that was literally the biggest audience I've ever played in front of. And it was, I think about 3000 and it was packed. Um, very luckily, you know, we were very lucky to have a packed crowd. Um, but I think that I genuinely thought about my parents while I was on stage um, at that, on the, on that gig. And I had Nick to my left, mm -hmm. um, just performing away. And he's, but he's, Nick's brilliant on stage. He's very, he's very animated. And you can see, you can see him in his, his, his old band, in your mind's eye, and gets friends of Gavin. I can imagine what it would have been like to be on stage with him then. It was <laughs> pretty similar, pretty similar to now. Um, and I think that for me, when I step on a stage, I'm just back at the Minac again, the Minac Theatre in Cornwall. And there's something about being on that stage where you have to, you can't put your head down. You have to look up because there's, there's an amphitheater that stretches. There's like about 500 seats that go up the cliff wow. and then a, um, a lighting box and then a gully of about 20 uh, sorry a gully of about 220 odd people on the on the right hand side and there's the uh, the sea behind you the ocean uh, and there are float mics in front of you so if you turn your head away to the ocean to the Atlantic you can't be heard mm. so that was my training on stage and I didn't have a microphone on my on my person uh, so you had to really kind of project. Yeah. Um, and so I think now if I now play play with the horn in front of these big crowds, um, my brain just kind of goes straight into kind of Minac yeah. uh, mode. Uh, and and I'm very, very thankful for that previous, previous acting life. Um, and also I, I think another element of it would be that Although Nick and I write the songs together, a lot of them are Nick's lyrics, which is a very interesting thing as a performer to do, to sing someone else's lyrics, to sing the lyrics of the person who stood next to you, which is a lovely, it's a wonderful thing, an incredible privilege. Um, and I think that Nick at the beginning, though, he and I had a conversation about, you know, he, Nick said, you know, we can, you know, you can use your performer, you know, you can, you can use your acting experience to be, to be the the role of the lead singer of the horn kind of thing. And now I feel like there's more of myself in it. But initially when you don't know what the project sort of is in the earlier stages, you do need to draw upon that old, that that sort of the previous experience that you've had of going on stage and sort of jumping. I'm not sure whether I put on a role for the horn anymore. I think I probably used to, didn't I, Nick? But now I feel like it can be a bit more more of me. Um but but yeah, it's like that interesting thing yeah. of like singing your own lyrics or singing someone else's lyrics or singing lyrics that you've co-written with someone or, uh, and obviously with Shakespeare, or with, you know, you're, you're telling someone else's story when you're on stage. So yeah, it's sort of interesting to play around with that. But yeah, I'd certainly say that like the, the kind of the, the stage experience, it, it's sort of an obvious point, but it, it's more about the size of the audiences. I think that I, you know, I was very, very lucky to be able to have that experience to, to feed into when we're suddenly thrust uh, in, on a stage in the O2 Academy, 3,000 people. I think the reason I don't buckle is probably because of my dear old dad who threw me on stage when I was eight years old. Well, yeah. the, the creative relationship to, between you both just feels really strong. How, what did the other members of the band bring to the band? Or uh, what, what, Because they're not here, we might as well give them a, a shout out. What, what do the other members of the band bring to the table with you guys? Because it, it, it looks like a really strong creative relationship you two have got. What do the others bring to the table? Can I go first? Yeah, Nick, you so, go first. So, so, so very, very, very quickly then. Um, uh, Johnny, I, I, I just, I just uh, saw in Johnny um, just an absolute star. That, that's how I would describe Johnny. He's a star. Oh, I um, thought you were going to talk uh, about the others. <laughs> I'm going to. I'm going to. Um, 
And, you know, it's just been incredible the last month when we've been on this incredible tour. Uh, um, we were supporting Scouting for Girls on nine, nine dates. And every night it got better and better and stronger and stronger and tighter and tighter. And and everyone performed more and more and more. So, no, I've got just the most fantastic feeling about about the band right now because we've literally just come off the tour and uh and, and johnny just performed so well he had the, the whole crowd was singing he was he was teaching them the lyrics and it was just it was just so cool and uh, danny danny monk he's he's on guitar um uh is is just like an absolute superstar guitar rock star amazing amazing talented guy and, and a beautiful man and then we have Alex Morse on drums. Um, Johnny will talk about Alex because uh, Johnny, because uh, Alex was a drummer in Montreal and beautiful guy, brilliant. And then finally, Ed, Ed Cox, who's um, keyboards, who's, um, you know, a just incredible musician. So, you know, with five brilliant musicians, um, five huge characters in different ways. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm like their father um <laughs> but uh which is it's you know we, we, and it sort of works you know i suppose it wouldn't work on you know on, on you know on paper but it sort of works um oh, that's johnny it. over to you <laughs> yeah it's great i mean nick that nick, was what dad's um, like yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'm a mad I, dad <laughs> the thing, thing is is that nick you're different to you're different to to, to my father but i don't think that even though our ages could could allow for that, I don't see you as I still see you as, you know, I would say a fun older brother rather than a you know, and not that much older. I don't think okay. that I think you're still it. young. You're still young at heart, and that's not being over complimentary. That's just I think that you've got a young spirit, and otherwise, I don't think you would have you would I don't think you would have started a band at this time, mm -hmm. this stage in your mm -hmm. life if you didn't have some youth and vitality. But I I do relate to that because my own. My, some of my family are getting older but they've got vitality in them as well and I, I think that that's potentially a key a key to a sort of spiritual longevity potentially so that I do see a lot of that in Nick and I, I think that's one of the things that's very exciting about this project is that Nick will always whenever we're recording something at the studio or rehearsing or doing something he'll just pull me aside and go I've got this song can we look at this song there's always a new song and that, True. you know, so, some people could just start a band and write 10 tracks or, or, you know, and then they might struggle to then keep going or, or sort of reach a bit of a block. But I don't, I don't think Nick doesn't do that. He doesn't, he doesn't yeah. seem to have that uh, block, which is fantastic. An incredible sort of trait in someone as a creative. And I think also Nick, he's a very generous person. He's with his time uh, and with lots of other things too, you know, he'll, He'll take us out for a meal, or whatever, and just just be very generous. Um, and I think you can't, you know, you can't you can't fake that shit. So I think, oh, sorry, S triple asterisk for those children. Don't repeat what I'm saying, children. It's fine. Um, but um, I think that 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 kind of that personality that Nick brings and warmth does extend and seeps into the rest of the project. And everyone knows when Nick's in the room, you know, he's he's the life and soul of the party. So. It's it's really fun having him, you know, around, and I think it's it's a fantastic project because of that, and and because of lots of other things, but mainly because, you know, I think Nick's sort of desire to to have fun and to make to make sort of this this whatever it is that he this itch that he wants to scratch from the eighties to kind of live on, and that's fan, that's fascinating and and really really fuels the project. And then I think you've got Danny, um, who, who I've known for a long time, and he and I are so different. Uh, and he he's almost like on the spectrum with his kind of um, diligence, and 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 I'm a bit wilder, and Nick knows this. So Nick Nick witnesses the contrast between me and Danny every time he goes into the studio, um, and I would say like. Nick, Nick would have told you this as well, but me and Nick and, and Danny were initially sort of like the, the beginning of the, I feel like that was the sort of the, the triangle where the horn really came from. And Nick went, walked down into the studio one day and just went, it's the horn, the horn. 
probably not even knowing that that's what the band name was going to solidify as. But you could have thought what of... else they were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that like it initially started as a studio project, and it was Danny and Nick. You know, that it was Nick bringing the stuff to Danny, and then. Um, as I've said in previous interviews as well, the fascinating stuff is that, for example, like a track like Passion, which was our first single, Nick wrote that a while ago. And so for us, I think you, did you write that in the 80s? Yeah, I, I wrote that in the 80s um, yeah. and I never recorded it. Um, and then I said to that, I've got this idea. And yeah, so it, it's basically the same song from the 80s, but we've completely yeah. cha changed it and a lot of the lyrics have changed and, uh, and you know, jo Johnny would have changed some of the lyrics as well because it's, it's really nice we sit down and Johnny will literally take take my iPad and start deleting and adding adding them and they're, <laughs> and, 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 and they're always good. Um, no, but sometimes so, yeah. you, you, you always, change it back. Always good. I do sometimes change every, it back. Every time good. Well, well I sometimes change it back. Perfect. Okay. It's mo it's 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 more good than it's not good. Oh, very. Okay, very <laughs> this is all very nice. You should, I mean, I think yeah, I think like and Danny, I've I've always thought <laughs> looks after the kind of textures, and Nick Nick and I tend to be probably. I is this fair to say we probably write a bit more than the other members of the band, yeah. and Danny kind of is very good at finding amazing sounds, and then also has written some great guitar parts. Um. But I'd say... I like the George Harrison up. part of the group. Potentially. Yeah, if you want to equate it to that. And then I think Alex... Because I was in a band with Alex um, before, and he's such a solid drummer. Like, he, he sounds great even without a metronome, without a click track. He doesn't need to sort of... He's got his own timing. Um, and he's a very gentle guy. You know, he's he's quite sort of... He can't, he can't keep a calendar together. Uh, at all, he can't. He doesn't know how to work a calendar. But my God, can he drum? Um, he's very good at drumming. And I, I also say he's, you know, he's got a nice bond with Ed. That when me and Nick and Danny stop playing in the rehearsal studio, Nick, Nick will probably nod in, in an understanding of, and 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 uh, recognition of this. But there'll always be like a few a few moments when Alex and Ed are having their own little jam on their own. <laughs> It's and basically I, I every time that. we, yeah, it's every time we <laughs> start, the three of us, they start <laughs> yes. um, pl playing, playing some, you know, sort of R and B yeah. uh, hit. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've exactly. Got, you've got your, you've got your recording time starting soon, guys. So let's talk about the, let, let's talk about the album within the description of this podcast. We're going to have a, you know, a, a download link for the straight, take you straight to this album. Now you've got a, your debut album completed do you feel a bit more grown up as a band because when i speak to bands it's the kind of it's kind of when the hard work starts you're not a new band anymore you've got an album now you're kind of grown up a little bit more you've got to stand on your own two feet it's where the hard work really starts again now moving forward that's the kind of vibe i get from a few bands how does it feel for you guys nick uh that was just brilliant i'm super proud of it yeah um people like us um by the horn yeah <laughs> um super proud I, I love every track on it um every single track means something huge to me personally mm. i know they all mean so much to johnny as well um so much has gone into it i mean we started this pretty much at the beginning of lockdown covid time pretty much yeah this pro yeah. project um and so it feels like you know that's you know we that was a big goal let's do an album and now it's done and it's on vinyl which we really love as well um out and and and, uh, and as i was just saying before we're about to hit a million streams and you know yeah. i think that i think that's really great for us we're proud awesome. of that obviously yeah. uh and uh, and did did you know this fantastic tour which was great and so for us 2024 is ahead of us and i think it's the second album we've already recorded three tracks done at rack actually where johnny is right now so three are already down um we've yeah, got two yeah, we've, we've got, already we've got, got a, some. we've got a couple that we we're going to do so you know we'll probably do another we, we need to find another five that's going to work so album number two is already we're already on it you know so really looking forward to putting that out probably the end of next year so yeah very proud really excited Wait. It feels like it's an exciting camp to be in. Um, uh, I, I just love watching it from afar and seeing how you guys are just cracking on and 
take it grabbing the industry by the bollocks because there's no other way is there, to get anywhere really I, I don't think yeah, you just you just gotta make of it what you can make of it right just <laughs> do your best yeah you, you can you can do you, do you feel a little bit more pressure now you've got your album behind you uh do you feel like you're moving on to album the troublesome album too uh might be more difficult or you're just gonna go for it i'm actually i'll take that one i don't think so interestingly yeah. I th there's a thing that Rick Rubin, the music producer, said, which is to try and like tr don't try and get an album by just choosing ten tracks or whatever. He said, try and write loads of songs and then pick five that you can't live without, and yeah. then add from there and see if the the, the, the next songs you add to those sort of uh, the tracks you can't live without, the ones you add to that those five make sure they sit in the right sort mm. of aesthetic with those songs. And then you have your album. And I think with the horn, it, it wasn't dissimilar to that in terms of Nick had written so many songs and I'd helped to sort of, me and Danny had helped to finish, uh, finish them. And, but some of them were quite fully formed, you know, like the melodies and stuff, some of the chorus melodies that Nick was bringing were already like, Oh, that's a, that's a finished chorus uh, in terms of melody. So it was up to sort of the three of us to, produce them and then hand them over to another producer um but i actually and yeah there's that famously tricky second album con uh, uh, sort of phenomena but actually i don't think i'm almost like even more excited about the second album mm. uh because i feel like we've really found our stride um and nick nick's written there's two more tracks that I, already that I'm thinking. Of. Actually, sorry, three more tracks that I'm thinking of. That I'm really excited about. Yeah, me um, too. It'll be on the yeah, like when we were in Ashbourne, we had a day off on tour, yeah. and Nick had this idea, and we sat in in the hotel with Ed on piano, and Nick was singing, and I was playing guitar, and yeah, there's a new track coming, which is going to be really good. Uh, and I, so yeah, hopefully. Um, we're not too big for our boots and ho hopefully the second album will be even better. So more tour dates planned? Is it more support stuff or are you doing like a headline thing next? Is there a plan around live yeah. in 2024? Yeah, yeah, that, but both. We're, we're yeah. working on the plan. We, we haven't got the plan yet, but we're working on it. But it'll be a, it'll be a both. It'll, we'll do some headline stuff and we'll definitely do another support tour. Yeah. So well, um, well, watch this, watch this space. Yeah, well said, well said. So within the description of this podcast, if it's on YouTube, just look down. If it's on the podcast, it's, it'll be in there. There'll be a link. Um, thanks for joining us today, guys. Uh, what Harry Potter's loss is the music industry's gain. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, oh, that, for joining that. us. And, uh, um, and yeah, we wish you all the best with the band. Keep cracking on. Keep being creatives. Keep, you know, knocking doors down and making things happen for you. It's great to see. And we really appreciate your time today, guys. And yeah, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks again. Thanks, Carl. Cheers, Cheers guys. Man. Thank you. Absolute pleasure, Carl. Thank you.